but it's fine with me. So, <laughs> all right. So yeah, thank you, thank you for those are uh, in the room and then also the students online. So yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, well, I will just uh, continue from last time, and uh, the, so but this time I will more focus on more on, on the technical side, programming side, and but still uh, a little bit uh, fundamental we need to prepare. And um, so last time I was stopped by the, the linear regressions, and the high level idea of linear regression is so given some uh, data, then we, we could fit a line. So, well, you know, very simple example will be a, a simple, a straight line. So for then given any point, uh, X value of given any X value, then from the face on the line, we can find the Y value. So yeah, they, it's, it, the relationship what we want to find is just a linear, so map x to y. So it's the linear regression. But with linear regression, we actually could fit various shapes of the lines, just uh, depending on the how how complex the model is. And but yeah, in the example we use, it's just a some simple straight line like this, and. So to feed a straight line, so we need to two uh, parameters. So the uh, a and the x. Then by finding the a and the x, uh, a and the b. So given any x value, we could use that to calculate the y. Uh, so which is uh, so we define the whole function as f. Then so given any x value, it will be f of x, so we can find the corresponding y. And in machine world, so we uh, we write, we use h to indicate the function. And then, uh, yeah, for the machine learning, we will need to have some training data. And then the training data will have two parts. One part is the uh, input. So uh, we also call them uh, input values or features. Then another thing is the Y, which is the ground truth. So our people also call it output, our label, our ground truth, target. So yeah, there are a bunch of different names, but basically it mean the same thing. And uh, then from here, we, we could train our model. So the training process will be, uh, okay. Basically, it will, I think I can skip a few of those. So, yeah, suppose, and then this is our, let me see if I can get, yeah, maybe, okay, maybe I, I will start with, from here. So, uh, well, suppose we, uh, we have the model and then we only have two parameters and then one, input value. So we will initialize the value of both of them to be something randomly Yeah, in the real case. But we say, OK, so let's say x uh, theta 0 equal to 0, then theta 1 equal to 0. So given this, I have the uh, equation of 0 plus 0x. Then so no matter what x I have, the output will be 0. So now I know how good this size of parameter is. And then to measure that, suppose I have a list of y. Okay, so this is y, and then the, maybe the first of y is one, then 10, two, three, six. Right. So assume this is the ground truth. And then, yeah, let me change another color. It will be better visit visually. And then so. Normally, we may use y hat to indicate the prediction, so the output. And the, now my model, no matter what I have, it will be y, will be zero, right? So, and the, finally, we can compare the cost, the cost of the model. So measures how wrong it is. And then with different cost function, well, let's say we just use absolute differences. 
So it will be one, ten, two, three, six. And if we sum everything, then uh, get the average over that. So one over six times the summation, then we got the basic cost of this model. So from here, we could use a strategy called a uh, loud, uh, called a gradient descent, and then to figure out. So let me go to. Okay, so yeah, basically we will use some cause function, like the one shows on the uh, screen, and the given every uh given the, the theta, so we want to find the cause of this particular model. Then we could basically build the uh, cause function map, which is the one on the right. So suppose, assume if before, so my theta is zero, then everything prediction is zero. So I will have a cause for these three examples will be one, two, three, and then, so the mean will be two. So I can find it on the right side. It's, uh, so my theta one is zero. Okay, and then, so now my cause will be the y axis, it's, it's two. All right, so I found one, and then with gradient descent, I, I could figure out no, should I increase or decrease the value of theta? So suppose I increase it to one, then now this time my prediction will be, uh, so for, uh, will be, well, it's perfect. Right, so yeah, then the cost will be zero, zero, zero. So I know if my theta is one, then the cost is zero. So, Normally we will have more points, right? And then we can draw the cost function like this. And then, so basically with gradient descent, we will start with one point and then gradually go to the minima. And then the minima will be the bias the theta to use for this particular uh, model and on this particular data set. So, well, one thing about machine learning is after we found a model, this model only guaranteed to work well on the given data set. Even with a similar data set, it is not guaranteed because the parameter is just figured out by this particular data set. So there are some advanced uh, strategy to improve the generalization, which means given a after train the model and then let it works better on some other data sites, but uh, yeah, it will be uh, coming in the future, not today. And so, yeah, then last time we build a simple linear regression model by ourselves. And uh, I'm not going to repeat that part. And then, but uh, yeah, creating descent, I can skip this. and. Yeah, I will just stop here. So for updating the parameter, we will use these two equations. And then so we uh, use the top one to calculate for theta zero and then bottom one to calculate for theta one. So the equation, it looks scary, but uh, if we read it through, then h theta of x is our prediction. So the y is the ground truth. Basically we are doing y prime minus y. So prediction minus the ground truth. And then uh, here after that, I feel like I'm missing a, uh, okay, no. Yeah, I feel like I'm missing a square there. But yeah, let's, hmm. yeah, it depends on what uh, I want to do. So yeah, so, now after that, I can I will have one a value, right? So the in my training data we may have n or m samples. So we will sum all the differences together and then divide it by m. So this will be the 
basically this part, right? And then the alpha is something called a learning rate, which decides how large each update is. And so we will play with it later. And then, uh, so last time I only uh, show the example of using only one parameters, uh, well, one input values, but in the real time, we have more input values actually. So assume if I have a data set like this, so I may have uh, how many, one, two, three, four, four, four different in, uh, input values. And then for based on four of those, I can come up with one, uh, the, the price of the house. Then still I, I could build a linear regression model. Basically what I will have is, um, so the H of X equal to theta, still theta zero, which is the bias term plus theta one, then times X, one x sub one so yeah i will denote this one is x sub one x sub two x sub three and x sub four here and then so we can have theta two x two plus theta three times x three plus theta four times x four okay so now yeah if we found uh the value corresponding value of all the thetas. So we are training a model on this data side with four different uh, input parameters. And uh, okay, so yeah, just uh, some notations here and the uh, N. So we, the number of features, normally we will denote it as N and um, yeah, so still X is the input. So, but now the uh, it's uh, X is a, a yeah input including multiple features, and then we use superscript to indicate uh, the is the the feature of the I yeah train, training example. Then the uh, subscript to indicate the feature. So which feature it is. So. One example will be, uh, okay, so if I say X, then hmm, what I want to do, so X two, three. Okay, so if I say this, which will mean the one, two, three, four, false, false row under the, the uh, second or third column. Right, depending on my uh, index, what is my index? So where the index start? Okay. And so, yeah. Then, wait. I should go back to here. Well, yeah, I can. I can go to here. Okay. So well, let's say we only have three parameters. So well, two, uh, we have two features and then three parameters. So theta zero plus theta one times X one plus theta two times X two. And then we could with this uh, model, this equation, we could always uh, add theta uh, X zero there if X zero equal to one. Right, so by if x0 equal to one after adding x0 there, it doesn't change anything, right? So theta zero times one is always theta zero. But by doing this, actually, it gave us two, we could uh, represent this equation with two uh, matrices. And this will be dramatically improve the performance of our, our model, or the computation. So then, from linear re algebra. How many of you are taking or took linear algebra before? Okay, cool. A couple. So then we could represent this. Uh, okay, theta two with uh, well two two vectors. So x sub one, x sub zero, x sub one, and x sub two. 
And this is actually the data and the model is represented within our computer. So for the linear re, uh, regression model is represented with, uh, we put all the parameters on one matrix and then the, the input on another. And so this also what is uh, how the computer uh, will calculate the result. This basically it's just the uh, multi multiplication of the matrices. And so by doing this, we dramatically improve the speed of the, the calculation because most of the math, mathematical libraries uh, are optimized uh, yeah, to improve the performance of uh, matrices. And okay, so well, this is linear regression. And linear regression works very well in many cases if we want to find uh, the continuous value. But suppose I have a task like this. Instead of finding some kind of values uh, or some housing price, so now I'm I'm working on a tumor prediction, and then so I want to know whether this tumor is malignant or, or benign, and then so each x is just a one sample I have, and then the y value indicates the label the target of each one. And so if by if here, if we fit, fit a linear regression model, the model will look like just a line like that, right? And so possibly if we cut it through the uh, point 0.5. So if we cut it through the y value of point 0.5, then we could separate uh, the two classes. So whether it's benign or malignant, and the assume so for my model, for this particular example, maybe it's giving me 0 0.2. And then so 0 0.2 is less than 0 0.5. So we say, yeah, benign. everything below than 0 0.5 is benign, everything above is one. So well, linear, uh, linear regression works in this uh, example, uh, this situation, how I were, if we have one more sample like this, then uh, so I have one more malignant sample. Then if we feed a model, the model will look like this. And then now if we cut the model from 0 0.5, it doesn't work anymore. So if I do 0 0.5, then there will be three malignant tumors be predicted or decided as benign. So this is bad. And uh, I used to work uh, with uh, doctors and the doctors, they, they, so if for some people has benign tumor and then predicted as malignant, they say it's bad, but it's not as bad as we tell someone, well, you are fine, but actually the person has some issue health issue. So this is actually pretty bad. And then uh, linear regression doesn't work anymore here. So what we need to do is, so now we are having a binary classification problem. And uh, so it's a classification we want to make, so which group the, the, the item or the sample is. And it is binary because there are only two charts and the binary, uh, classification uh, widely uh, exist in our real world. So like email spams is binary. So whether it's spam or not. And then like uh, transaction uh, detection. So fraud detection is also binary, yes or no. Well, tumor uh, detection, so malignant, benign is also binary. So there are many things are binary <coughs> and then with binary classification, so our why the, uh, the target or the ground truth will be either zero or one. So most of the time zero indicates the negative class and then one indicates the, the positive class. And then with binary classification, so what we are hoping is 
still go back to this example. So what we are hoping is still using linear regression, but given the linear regression output value, so it uh, we will somehow convert it to only zero and one values. So this is uh, what we are hoping to do. And then it's, it turns out that there is a strategy, a method called a logistic regression. It's just a task, the exact the same thing uh, we want to do. So then, okay, so for to, yeah. So this uh, is for given, we still use h of x to represent our model, but given any uh, x value, we want to convert the the output between zero and the one. And so this is how logistic regret regression do. And then now the theta uh, transpose x is denote as our linear regression model, because if you remember, so I could put all my uh, thetas, theta zero, theta one, in one vector and then so my all my features x1 x2 in another so now we can have the uh multiplication right so yeah theta uh transpose x actually denote with the linear regression now our output is linear regression so it's a uh value from negative infinity to positive infinity but what we want is to put this value inside of uh, a function called sigma. Well, it's another equation. And well, let's just say it's, we call it G. Okay, so yeah, as the function is G and then the function is basically is a mathematical equation. So now we want to put it into G and then the value of G uh, will equal to G equal to one over the e to the negative z. And then now the the negative the z value will be so the our linear regression value will be like will be the z value. So we want to plug it into the uh to the g which is the logistic regression. And then so from the logistic regression so if we if you work the math through, then uh, suppose my linear regression will give me value like this. But if you work the logistic regression through, then uh, it nicely convert okay, so just a convert what I were linear regression value is between uh, zero and the one. So it will never get one and then never get zero, but yeah, it will be uh, very close to one and close to zero. So this is a uh, logistic regression. And then from here, we could use logistic regression to uh, on our classification problems. And okay, so well, it's just uh, some uh, probability. So yeah, then for our logistic regression, it will give us a probability actually. So the output of the logistic regression is the probability of if when given y, y equal to one, y equal to zero, and then uh, the probability will be uh, something. And then also given the uh, if y equal to one, so yeah, the probability is, uh, is one minus, okay. So, well, basically the sum of them will be one. And then each of those, depending on the, the, the task, well, let's say maybe given uh, a particular model, a particular data sample, so my model output is 0.7, then we say, okay, so there is a 70% chance the tumor to be uh, malignant. And this is actually all thing the model tells us. So 
then when I work with the doctors, doctor always ask, so, okay, 70% chance, what does that mean? How, how should I tell the, the patient? And this will bring us to next term or uh, concept, which is decision boundary. So neural network models, or, or most of the machine learning models nowadays, uh, is based on the probability. Then we need to convert the probability to decision. And which means we need to have a decision boundary. And in binary classifications, most of the time, people use 0.5 as decision boundary. So if the result is higher than 0.5, then we say it's one class. If it's lower than 0.5, we say it's another. But again, the decision boundary is just a, a, some uh, choice coming uh, this is, uh, the design choice. And then for some cases, if the doctors really want to eliminate a uh, wrong prediction on uh, negative cases, then it may reduce the, the, the bar to something to, uh, let's say, uh, maybe point of one. So everything below point of one, okay, I'm sure it's negative, but above point of one, it could be positive. So yeah, decision boundary is just a, some design choice, but most of the time, uh, it's kind of a, a, a default choice is 0.5, but it is not the best one. And okay, so well, now let's say talk more about neural networks and uh, well neural network is just uh, some kind of machine learning model and then try to mimic human nerves and people has been doing this for a long time 50 60 years and there were variety uh res researchers research on this line like the first one image shows so some people develop a sensor. So actually we could put the sensor on our tongue and then through our, we, we could see through our tongue. So this is pretty amazing, right? So look, so this gentleman has a camera and then the camera is actually connected to a sensor. So he put the sensor in the mouth. And then after that, if he closed the eye, he can still see things. It's pretty amazing, right? So yeah, it's just a try to, we, we could, uh, the research the project to try to send the signal through tongue to our brain. Question? No. Yeah. So, and then on the right side, it's a similar research uh, from, uh, coming from Neuralink, I think in 2011, uh, 2021, fairly recently. So uh, it shows a monkey could play a pong game with his tongue also. So basically the monkey doesn't do any control, just a stick a thing in the mouth and uh, just a purely think. Then the monkey could play the game. So pretty amazing. And the neural network supposedly or uh, ideally uh, trying to mimic the, the neural nerve system. And, but actually it's still, still far away from the neural nerves. And then the only similarity I would consider is, so for neural networks, we also have neurons and with human nerves, we also have neurons. The, the only similarity is, for, so this suppose is one neuron in our brain and the, the neuron will get some information has parts to gathering input information and then has a part to uh, compute some output, combine the information together and then the neuron could uh, send it to other neurons. So the only similarity is here, but the human uh, neurons are more complex than the artificial neurons we are talking about. And then, so this is just a one old paper, 1940, 1943 paper. We're talking about uh, this idea of neural network. Yes. 
Yes. Well, I I don't know, but I would think so. So, but it doesn't. The method didn't help help the monkey to cheat. Just uh, let the monkey to control. Yeah, just uh, like the game pad, game pad, but without a game pad. Yes. Sir. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah, yes, supposedly. Yeah, supposedly. But uh, I have seen this picture for years, but I have never seen a real application. But but people are doing research like that. Well, so we will we need to handle in that case well uh, one design choice is given uh you we could have multiple binary uh binary uh logistic regressions running parallel kind of right so then we do one worse all uh, prediction whether it's the first choice or other and then whether the second choice or other Uh, well, yes and no. So by default, no, because the housing price prediction is supposed to give a, 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 a continuous value. So logistic regression doesn't work well on those. How I work with neural networks and then with some other uh, techniques, it could work. So yes. All right. And OK. So. Yeah, this is another old paper from 1980s. And then, uh, so if you are familiar, you heard the term CNN, which is the one I'm going to uh, create later. So convolutional neural network. And uh, I think this was the original paper for CNN and the, the published in 1980, 1981, around 1981, I think, early 1980s. And yeah, so basically the artificial neural network uh, got popular in the 1980s and the 90s, but then it's kind of failed in the 1980s and the cooling down there due to two reasons. The first one is the, the uh, limited computation we had before. Right. So nowadays, a cell phone, the computational power is equivalent to a supercomputer back to that time. Then the other is the limited data amount we have, really. And so the current wave, I have talked this in many, many uh, different places. It's really, I would say, starting with this image night data site. So it contains over 1 million images with labels. And then with such a huge data set, we could train uh, neural network models. And uh, also we need the computational power also. And then this is why NVIDIA got popular, extremely popular these days. So with GPU cards, we could run codes in parallel. And then uh, otherwise it may take, uh, I don't know, years or hundreds of years to train one model. But with GPU, yes, uh, we could then depending on the scale and the fairly fast. So uh, the ImageNet data set contains uh, 1000 classes and this uh, was the neural network. Well, not all of those, but uh, before, okay, so before here were some conventional methods, <clears throat> but after that were just a purely uh, neural network performance. And so the, uh, until 2012, uh, 2020, the highest performance is around slightly over 90% accuracy. And this is pretty good because for random guessing, the accuracy is 0.1%. Uh, so if we just randomly guess there, because there are 1,000 classes, and then the a human performance on this task, so they did two tests and the two uh, Stanford students, one student trained himself on the data for, I think for a week. 
then the other train himself for a couple of hours. So the first one got 95% accuracy and the second student got 90%. So if a model has 90% or 95%, then basically it's close to a human performance. So it's pretty good. And neural network actually is a huge and a fast developing field. And so here just shows some illustration of different neural networks. And uh, so, well, there are many types. I personally, I never used, like I have no idea what this one is. And then well, I know the first one and I don't, I never use this one. So, well, there are many different types of neural networks. It's a huge complex field and the, most of the researcher or people are only familiar with a few of those. And uh, so, well, uh, the one uh, I am going to show you all, uh, today is called a feed forward neural network. So, uh, which is also one of the uh, basic type of neural networks and well, here is one figure illustrate that, and uh, you may see things, similar things uh, at different places. And the, also people, well, especially for computer vision people, so people work with images and uh, really like to use cats and the dog images. I don't know why, but it's just widely used. So, so I, I, I put a little cat there too. And this uh, represents a particular site of a, of a feed forward neural network. So basically each, each circle uh, is called a neuron. And then the neurons at the same level is called a layer. So yeah, then in this example, uh, we have four different layers. And also this neural network is called a also called a fully connected neural network. So we said it's fully connected because the neuron in the higher level is connected to, to all the neurons in the next level. So yeah, this is a fully connected. And is there anything I want to say? Okay, so well, yeah, then what, uh, a network does, or a neuron does, is uh, just uh, go back to the human example. So this one, well, this is the only similarity. So the neuron will gather information, then do the computation and the pass it to the next, next level. That's it. And where, okay. So yeah, it will gather information, then do the computation and the pass. Then uh, there are some particular names for the different layers. The first layer is for is the input. So we call it input layer. And then the last layer is the predicted result, the output. So we say it's last output layer. Then everything in between are called the hidden layers. And so I assume uh, you all heard deep learning before, right? So until, so when I started the research in, in the field and it was 2014, 15, and then it was the term deep learning just uh, got, got popular and the people, many people, oh, still nowadays people were confusing what deep learning means. And uh, actually, so deep learning means neural network, but why it's called deep? So uh, how deep is deep? And then back to that time, basically, three layers and the more will be deep learning. And then the, now we have uh, four layers, right? If we calculate, if we include the input, if we don't, it's three layers. And then this is a deep learning model, deep neural network. But nowadays deep a neural network could get hundreds of layers more. And, but yeah, I would still say, okay, anything uh, above three is deep. Then, so we said each neuron is getting some information 
And then you also see the little question marks, right? So each neuron is getting information, do some calculation, and then pass it uh, to the next. And so if we open the neuron, the figure on the right side could be one particular neuron. And then if we uh, translate this everything to an equation, then it will be x1, w, i1, plus x2, w, sub i, comma 2, plus x3, w, sub i, comma 3, plus x sub r, w, i, comma r. Okay, so yeah, the first part is the equation trans. I just the road. Now we see the uh, similarity, right? So it's ex almost exactly the same with linear uh, re linear regression. And then the second part. So this one we call it an uh, activation function, and uh, well. The activation function is also called a nonlinear activation. So, well, it's a mathematical, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, functions. So we want to pass the output through a nonlinear function, regardless what it is. We could use anything, but we want a nonlinear because uh, from the linear algebra. So when we combine multiple linear algebra, uh, models together it is still linear so yeah regardless how complex the model is it only learned a linear relationship so that's why we want to have a, a non-linear function and then turns out logistic regression okay it's one of the widely used uh, non-linear uh, activation functions there and uh, then so which means basically we could consider each neuron, it's just a one uh, logistic regression model. And then we pass the logistic regression model to uh, the next layer. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, so well, the decision tree, you will only go through a particular path to find the result. Yeah, but for this one, so we we are not trying to select which path to go. We try to uh, use all the uh, values represented there and then do the calculation. And then based on the calculation, it will tell us something. Yeah, so, so yeah, well, yeah, there are some similarity looks similar, but and then, so back to the, also back to the question before. So can logistic regression uh, work on the uh, regression task? So get the real value under the now it's yes. So it's just a depends on what uh, output, what cause function we want to use and then whether uh, do we have a logistic regression on this layer or not? Oh, well, there are many other things could, could, be, could be used like softmax and the others, but whether we also want to put that into a nonlinear function or not. If no, then we have, now we have the output is from the negative infinity to positive. So, all right. And well, so the, the, the neural network uh, is really computational intensive. And just to give you some idea about why and how. The, so this picture is, uh, this lady is widely used in the field also. And I can't remember her name, but from some South American country. And uh, I think maybe this lady maybe, well, now is old. So 80, 90 years old, or maybe more, I, I don't know, but, yeah, the picture was taken in, in the 
s e n t i e s I would say. So, so she is for famous. Well, this picture is famous. And suppose we uh build a neural network and then try to classify whether a picture is for this girl or not. And uh, suppose we only have a super simple neural network. So we have two hidden layers. And the first layer has 2,000 units, well, number of neurons, second, 500. And then the input of the image is also small. So it's uh, 256 by 256. Okay, so a small input, then a small size uh, image, then which means there are 65,000 of uh, uh, pixels. So everything is super small. However, it's turned out the size of the model could be over 100 megabyte here. Yeah, because so if we have for this layer, for the okay, for the first hidden layer, it has itself has 2000 neurons and then it will need to take 65,000 uh, of uh, input. Then there will be, so the total computation on number of parameters will be 2000 times 65,000. And then again, so for each one, we will get uh, each uh, multiplication, we will get a value, right? So if we start the value into a double variable, and then, so that particular layer will give us a hundred megabyte. And so this why the neural network wasn't a big thing back before 2020, 2010. And all right, so well, uh, one more thing before we can start the code, uh, which is in many cases, so we need to do a multi-class classification. So not only zero and one, we have many classes. Like the, <clears throat> excuse me, image night, we have 1000 classes. Right. And then, so like the assume so well, we, we have a subset from ImageNet, we only have four class, pedestrian, car, motorcycle, and the tracks. Then uh, we will have so four outputs at the output layer. So four neurons at the output layer. The number of neurons will be equivalent to number of uh, classes. And then, so each neuron will be corresponding to just one class. And then, so for each of them, we will have a continuous value prediction. <clears throat> so how to decide? Uh, we will, okay. So we will use something, a technique called the one heart encoding. So translate the label to a vector. And if I have four, uh, four classes, so then I translate it to a vector of length of four. So then, so initially, so all the values are zero, then the one, so the, the, the uh, entry with one indicates the, uh, label actually. So if the label is one, then we have the one zero 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 like this. If the label is two, we have zero one zero zero. And then so if label is three, we have zero zero one zero, etc. So if the output has one thousand classes, then we will have a vector of one thousand uh, as the output. And then finally, we could compare. <clears throat> now, so because each of new, the neuron will give us one output, right? So then which means the output of my model will be uh, some something, let's, let's say, so y prime one, y prime two, then y prime three, y prime four. And then I also know the ground truth target. Okay, so supposedly it's for track is zero, 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 one. Now I could pass this two thing to our cost function to do a comparison and then figure out 
the the how wrong it is or how close it is. And then so the loss function here is called a uh, it's called uh, the uh, we are going to use is the the uh, what's the name cross entropy laws, and uh, well so basically it's this one, and uh, well we are not going to implement it, so we will just uh, use the <coughs> excuse me the high level function for that, but we pass the uh, both of the prediction the prediction and the ground truth to it, and the, it will give us a, a value. So well, suppose the so we want to get as small as possible, and all right. So basically, it's all the necessary uh, knowledge, the information we need to know. Then let's go to the code. So I will use uh, CodeLab, and also for the programming part, I will use uh, PyTorch. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a good question. So conventionally people will do uh, 80%, 20% or 70%, 15, then 15, so conventionally, but <clears throat> nowadays with uh, deep learning and the data size is large. So we actually do not need that much of testing. So if suppose, let's say maybe if we have a hundred thousand samples, maybe, well, uh, 80,000 for training, then maybe 10,000, well, maybe uh, maybe only 5,000 for, for validation, and then 15,000 for testing. Now, all the number could be even smaller, so. Well, uh, so the thing we want, yes, yes. So we, we want to have better, a higher accuracy. And then, but then the, we also want, <clears throat> so we may have three different sites. So the training validation and the testing, right? So we, we after the model is trained, we first the, uh, validate the model on the validation. And then, so, because on training, we always get, well, ideally always get perfect result, but we want to use validation to find so the model may train for a hundred hours. So which particular hour has the best uh, performance. And then uh, from there, we pick the best one and then we test it again on the testing side. In this case, so uh, we, uh, we try to be not biased because the best one is picked the, by the validation. So we want to also val validate it again on something not used in the training or picking up the model. Then, so uh, yeah, this will be more robust, well, more, more uh, unbiased, I say it. So yeah, you're welcome. And yeah, so yeah, PyTorch is the one I use. And then there is also uh, another popular one for TensorFlow and Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do for today is to uh, just uh, build a simple classification model and uh, uh, to classify, uh, what's the name? And, and missed, fashion I missed. Okay. So yeah, there is a small toy data set, so fashion amnes, uh, which contains I think ten different types of clothing or uh, uh, shoes. Uh, uh, and then so let's the model to see whether it's a, a pants or whether it's a shoe. So yeah, this is the task we want to do. And then to build the model, we need to to and to train the model. We need uh, <coughs> excuse me few different things. So first they load the data site and then also we need to build the model, then train the model. So there are few different tasks 
we need to do. And then let's import some libraries first. So import torch, which is for the PyTorch. And then so also from torch import in, in then from torch.utils dot data import data loader then from a uh, torch vision import uh, data site and then from torch vision import uh okay i'm sorry so torch vision dot transforms import to transform. okay and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, then we'll import a few additional. TQDM is uh, for managing the training progress, so visualization, then plot.lib.py plt. Okay, so yeah, also might plot, uh, plot lib for the uh, visualization. All right, so then So yeah, the first thing we need to do is to get the data side, <clears throat> excuse me. And so he, the, uh, this, since this is a toy data side and then PyTorch does provide it through Torch Vision. So we could use Torch Vision dot data side and then to get it. And so, yeah, let me get train, training data equal to data side dot uh fashion so yeah fashion amnest and then so some parameters root equal to data equal to All right, so well, uh, let me explain this one. So the uh, PyTorch provide both training and validation. And so with the function, we set training equal to true to download the training side. And if training equal to false, to download the uh, validation side. So now I have the, uh, the training side and then, <clears throat> excuse me, the root is where I want to save the data. So currently I save under a data folder and the, do I want to download? So yes. And then so transform to tensor. So uh, after downloading, so well, after load the data, uh, since it's image, then uh, the default type will be a uh, NumPy array. But with TensorFlow, we need to convert everything to tensor. So it's a, a, just a data type. And then, yeah, we do to tensor, okay. Then similarly, I will use the same method to same way to download the test side. So test the data and the only difference will be change trend to false. Okay, so yes. And okay, so this is one part and then now this, just go ahead, download the data. It should be fairly fast. Okay. And so if we run, yeah, there is a data folder. Under the data folder, we have the amnest, uh, fashion amnest. Under fashion amnest, so we have raw. Okay, under raw, we have the, uh, the binary files. A training to equal to false. Yes. All right, so yeah, this is, uh, we downloaded the target data and then sometimes, most of the time for the real task, we need to upload our real data also. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then after that, we need to create a, the data loader. So create a data loader is will be used to load data to our model. 
because neural network, so deep learning on the data side could be skewed. Like the uh, uh, the one, uh, what's the name? Image night. So the size is 100 gigabytes. So we cannot load the, the entire data site at one time. So we need to create a data, data loader for that. And then one of my latest project has sample for 300,000 images. So yeah, I, there's no way, 10, 15 gigabyte. I, there's no way to load them together. So, so we need to uh, create a data loader. Then for data loader, we need one parameter, which is a uh, specify something called the batch size. And the batch, uh, so it's one batch, it's just a one uh, load the data for one time. And then the batch size is how many data we want to load for one iteration. Well, uh, how, how, how much space? Well, it's depending on your batch size and the, your data. Okay, so suppose, let's say if one, we are using one image, image and the each is one megabyte, then batch size 32 will load 32 of those. So yeah, so it depends on the batch size and the, your model. And so now I need two separate uh, data loaders, one for the training. So data loader equal to, so training and data. And then, so, let me finish the next line. Test. Okay. So now we have two uh, data loaders. And the idea here is, <clears throat> well, there are two, two different philosophies to decide how large the batch size is. And personally, so, the, I, I would say minimum size will be six, uh, will, will be 16 for most of the time. But uh, then one philosophy is we want to feed as much uh, data into our uh, memory as uh, possible. So if we have a GPU for uh, eight gigabyte memory, so yeah, we want to feed as much as possible. So combine the model, combine the, the data, yeah, we want to fill up the for the eight gigabyte. And so this is one idea. And then another strategy is said, okay, so sometimes people may prefer for smaller batches, but still minimal size, I would say is uh, above 16. So, and, <clears throat> okay. All right, so, well, let's say 32. So my often use is 128, 256, something like that for me. Okay, and then, well, let's just uh, uh, validate the, the, the data uh, a, a little bit. So, well, first, if we print, okay, if we print the length of the training data loader, we can get the how many batches it has. So, the number of batch, batches depend, is uh, equal to the number of data divided by batch size. And so, well, let's get one byte so far. Our data uh, in. Okay, so this is a quick way. So yeah, my trick to get one batch of data, just a put in a for loop. Then each iteration will get one batch from the loader. And then, so if we say the, uh, Oops, well, what I meant is the length of data. So, well, length of data. Yeah, so the length of data is two, okay? And so the length of the first uh, direct, uh, yeah, uh, dimension is 32, and then plus two, the length of a second dimension is also 32. Oops, yeah, I cannot do that. It's also 32. So 
the reason we get the length of two is, well, if I do, did I import NumPy? So let me also import NumPy. And then, so with, um, no, no. So now we see for the uh, first dimension of the data, we have 32 samples and the, each one, the shape is one by 28 by 28. So 28 by 28 is the image size. Then the one is the color channel. So we have the grayscale uh, image. So it's, uh, 30, it's just a one single channel. And then, so, but this for the uh, data uh, index zero which is the image. And then for index one is the target, is the label for each example. And so let's visualize it and x equal to data zero, y equal to data index one, then uh, PLT, well, let's get a figure. Bigger size equal to eight comma ten. So I'm going to uh, print the twenty five figures. So plus five comma five comma I plus one. It's I. Okay. Yes, should be good. Okay, so now, <clears throat> kiss me. I displayed some images from the batch, and then the label, uh, the the title is the the predicted label. Well, not predict the ground truth label, and just uh, use the uh. So PLT, if you use the uh, subplot, it will give you the uh, sub images. And then the first two parameters, a uh, number of rows and the number of columns. So now I have five rows, five columns. The third parameter is the index of the image. Well, yeah, so the index here starts with one. One, two, three, four, five. And then the second row is six, seven, eight, nine, ten, et cetera and the plt dot image show to show one image and so i get to the index first the image and then so the uh the first uh, color channel and then to show the entire image and so i so convert it to grayscale and then lastly for each subplot i have the title there all right so yeah this is just some data under the uh, data visualization is very important, I would say. So getting a new project, try to visualize your data first. And uh, yeah, it will tell you some story there. And all right, so now we have our data and then let's create the model. <clears throat> so with PyTorch, you could, yes, sir. So with PyTorch, you could load some existing models. So there are many popular ones. Uh, you could load and modify, but uh, so for now, I will start with uh, from everything from scratch. Grayscale, okay. So uh, if without the gray uh, color map, it just to display the image in some weird form, format. Well, it, yeah, if it's a grayscale image, then yeah, useful for use the gray. And also, <clears throat> so the P 
PLT treat image, so the dimension will be the x, uh, the 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 uh, width, height, and then color channel. But for PyTorch, they put color channel at the beginning. So yeah, so my trick is just to take the color channel as zero, always as zero. Yeah, otherwise we need to shave the, the dimension. So yeah, okay. And then let's create the model. So the model will uh be a, a, a class actually. So class and then I call it MLP. So uh, it's the model name. And well, you could call it whatever. And then it uh, extends the n, n dot uh, module. Okay. And then so the model to define, we need to define two things. Uh, the uh, So we need to define two things. One is the model structure. The other is how the data will be passed through the model. And so let's do the first one. And uh, so need self and super called the super constructor. All right, so now, yeah. Well, if you don't understand those, let's find just a <clears throat> memorize. We have to have those for the class. And then, okay, so now it's our model. And uh, the model, I only want to have, uh, how many layers I have? One, two, okay, so three hidden, uh, two, well, one hidden layer, one input layer under the, well, two, two hidden layers, one input, one output, <clears throat> excuse me. So. It's super small and the uh, with uh, fully connected, we will use uh, and, and dot a linear, linear and 28 by 28, then 40, 96. So this is my uh, first layer and uh, it will give me a fully connected layer then the two parameters are the input shape and the output shape of this layer. So if we go back to our slides and uh, when working with neural networks, really the, the shape is, uh, oh, where is my slides? Okay, so uh, possibly I close it, but that's fine. So suppose for this layer, for this, can I, okay, I cannot highlight it, but for, yeah, for the uh, third layer there, then the input size will be three. So how many outputs from the previous one, then the output size will be how many neurons we have here. And this is extremely important with uh, neural networks. So uh, yeah, one of the common error people have is the uh, input output or uh, input shape mismatching. So then the 28 by 28 is the image size. So yeah, each pixel will be one uh, feature. Then we have 28 by 28. Then, uh, but to make it a model, so I will do self dot uh, linear. So it's just uh, uh, some name, so. In your sequential, oops. Okay, so now, uh, yeah, now I could use the uh, linear sequential to refer my model. And then my model has the first layer. After that, we can add uh, an end out value. Then, so ReLU is the uh, activation function. So what we could use sigmoid, sigmoid, and so sigmoid is logistic regression, and uh, it's also fine. But well, let's keep it use sigmoid for now. And but uh, ReLU may work slightly better. So 
linear. Okay, so I can create the second layer. And then the second layer input shape will be 4096, which is the output from the last layer. And then, so this layer, I may have 512 uh, neurons. And then let's do the uh, NN dot. Mode again, and uh, so well, next layer will be my output linear, so 512 and the 10. Also, the output uh, layer, uh, the shape needs to be the number of uh, class we have. Like this data set has 10 classes, so we set 10 there. And all right, so basically, this is the uh, it's the, the structure and but we need to do one more thing self dot of lighten so yeah because our input is a two-dimensional image however the neural network here we are taking is it to be a vector so we do flatten to uh, convert the matrix matrix to uh, to a, a, a vector all right, so that that is good. And then let's define the data flow. So that forward. So yeah, well, we have to use the forward as the name and pass in self, then X will be the input. So X equal to self dot flight and X. And then uh, logics equal to uh, well, let, let me go. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So self dot a linear. Okay. And then, all right. So now this is the, the data passing. So given the input X, firstly pass it through the uh, flatten layer. And then the output will also be passed through the, the entire model. After that, we return the output. And then the output for neural networks is uh, many times it's called a logit. So logit means the raw output from a neural network. And okay, so now this is our model. Then, so we could create a, the model by uh, creating a inst model instance there in MLP equal to uh, MLP. So by doing this, so I call the class and then I create an instance of the class, right? So I created a model and we could, oops. Excuse me. So with PyTorch, thank you. So with PyTorch, if we do print, it will print out the structure of our model. And all right. So now after having the model, we could start with training. So, but for training, I will, well, let's define a function for that. So I, I will have a train function and then the train function will take uh, several uh, parameters, data, loader, model, what model we want, loss function, and the device, optimizer and the device. Okay, cool. <clears throat> then model dot train. So the model will be uh, the one we created and then we need to, for the training, we need to set the model to train, which is indicates uh, for the training mode. Hello, yes sir. Are you? Oh, okay. It's not to a six. Oh, okay. So yeah, we, we yeah, <laughs> okay. All right, so, thank you. Yeah, we will finish. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah, so well, yeah, still have minutes and then so we want to set it to train and uh, then what's the next I want to do okay so now we can load the data so for 
that x comma y equal to numerate data loader. Okay, so now I load one batch from the uh, data loader. I have a typo there. Okay, now it's good. And then, so from the data loader, I split the data batch to the X and the Y. And X equal to two, X dot two device. So yeah, I will explain this later. So Y equal to Y dot two device. Okay. Then, yeah, so this is loading data. And so next is gonna feed the data to the model. While well, this will be relatively simple. So predict equal to model X, <clears throat> excuse me. And then now we are passing, okay, capital X, given the model, to, given input to model and then get the prediction. So, compute loss. Uh, which one? So X and Y. Uh, no, not 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 yet. So well, it will load the data there, and so well, that's fine because also it's within the function. So, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so well, we have the loss function. Loss function is compute is compare the prediction and then the ground truth. So help us to compute the, the cost. And uh, uh, for loss function, we need to give the prediction and the y. So in this case, we know what side. And uh, okay, so one more thing. So back propagation. So back propagation through this uh, chain, then we will update the parameter of our model. So so optimizer is the uh, algorithm we want to use how to update the uh, parameter, and then we do loss dot back backward, and to compute the gradients. So then finally we do optimizer dot uh, step. Now we are updating the, <clears throat> excuse me, finally updating the, the, the parameter there. And okay, so basically this is the training and then let's also have some logs there. So if step mod uh, 100 equal to zero, then loss, okay, so equal to loss dot item. Then we want to print step and the percent B loss uh, percent point four F. Okay. Then what I want to do, okay, so step loss. All right. So this will be our training uh, code, training method. So we take in the data loader model and the loss function, also optimizer and then device, because we could choose using the CPU or GPU. So the device will be the one we select to use. And then, uh, okay, so then let's uh, create one, uh, function very similar, but for the testing. So, so for the testing, we need also data loader loss function. Well, whether do we want to print the loss or not, and the device we need to have then uh, model dot. So we need to set the model to evaluation first. Then, yes. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. 
Uh, I, I, sorry, I still didn't. A parameter. The third one. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, last one. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so what we we need to start to evaluation mode, and because it internally it will does something for us. And so maybe I want to test loss equal to zero. Then so correct equal to zero. Okay. Please touch dot no right. So with PyTorch, every parameter is associated with the gradients. And then the gradients uh, will add together and then take space in our memory. And, and also gradient will be used to update the, the parameters. So for testing, always we want to put it in uh, torch dot no grind. So turn out turn out turn off all the gradients. And then now I can basically copy and paste there. So pass the model, pass the data to the model, and then compute the loss. And then I can do pass loss plus equal to. So here I do loss dot item, which is also uh, the thing. Uh, so I only get the value there, so now to the gradient things there. And okay, so then let's get to the prediction. So y hat equal to predict the arc max i. Uh, yeah, so arc max will find the, the, the largest one of the largest uh, prediction. And then so that will be the the uh, the index of the largest value. And then so right. Yeah, let me do this please. Right. Plus equal to y hat equal double equal y dot. Dot, dot, sum, dot, item. Okay, so now for every prediction, I compare with the ground truth and then convert the type to a uh, flawed. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then I do the sum, so it will sum uh, all the ones, give me the, the, the total number of corrected uh, predictions. And then, so, uh, Okay, so yeah, this is, I'm sorry, all of this should be under the loop. And so for each batch, I want to track the, the uh, correct, how many are correct. And then, so finally I can print, after that I can print. That's, that's the accuracy percent uh, dot for F. So, so the correct divided by total samples, right? Total samples will be a uh, batch size times uh, the length of the uh, data loader. All right, I think this should be good. So the correct number divided by total samples. And all right, so this is the testing. And then now we can work on the training, the real code for training and the test. So, uh, well, let's get device. So device equal to either uh, CUDA. It's available as CPU. So the device, if the CUDA touch the CUDA is available, so which means we have GPU, then let's use CUDA, <clears throat> excuse me. Otherwise let's use CPU there. And okay, so well, we can print out the device just for uh, verification, then we can create a model 
model equal to MLP. So we want to send the model to the same device with the uh, data samples. Otherwise, yeah, you may also get error there, which is another common error. And model. And uh, so optimizer. And well, let's <clears throat> define the loss function first. Loss fn equal to uh, nn dot cross entropy. So PyTorch uh, provide many uh, loss we can use and the cross entropy is just one of those. And then optimizer is a uh, torch dot opti dot SGD. So SGD is one version of grade, uh, gradient descent. And um, then we need to give the input is model dot parameters. So now we said, okay, so let's update all the parameters of the model. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then LR equal to Okay, so while well, LR indicating the learning rate there, and this is good. Epoch before five. So yeah, let me start, then I will explain that part. Finish. And then, so what we need to do is just a call the train message, train data loader model loss from flow. Yeah, well, we have a workshop and uh, yeah, have, have a seat. And then we are talking about the uh, neural networks. So, nice. Data loader model was fun and okay. So let me start my training. Hopefully, I don't have air, but well, I do. So in in cross entropy y oh cross cross entropy loss. Sorry about that. Okay, let's run. Seems I'm good. I'm doing good. Okay, so well, uh, that's why I got here data type. Okay, okay so change is the bar. Okay, so I don't need to have the parenthesis there. Okay, so let's run again. So uh, the term epoch here, which means the model uh, seen the entire training cycle one time will be one epoch. And then the data loader, so we'll load the data in epochs. So well, after one batch, so those data will not be loaded again until the start of the next uh, epoch. And why I have the air again there, <clears throat> which is string. Price is string, no it. All right, so uh, I will do this way. And hopefully, it's uh, all the airs. And then, so, uh, with PyTorch, so you could go to runtime and then go to the uh, change runtime tab. So there will be a GPU, free GPU to use. 
So you could use that. And then, well, let's use, so now I'm using CPU. And uh, <clears throat> so my accuracy is quite high, but yeah, this, uh, I should divide it, it by the 10,000 also. So well, which means, well, at this moment, my model doesn't learn anything, right? Only 10% of accuracy. So, and uh, there are a couple of reasons could be potentially. One is the, <clears throat> excuse me, if we go back to the model, we use the uh, sigma is there. And so uh, if we change it to right loop, may work slightly better. So I will let the model finish training since it is fairly fast, but still, yeah, doesn't learn anything there. Okay, so let's, change it back to ReLU, and then I will change it back to uh, CPU, GPU also. So yeah, remember we have trained it for one minute, and then how about if we change to GPU, and so well, we run everything. Uh, yes, run out. Now I am using GPU for training, <clears throat> excuse me. Supposedly, so yeah, well, the the ones, yeah, the advantage will show when the model is large, but at this moment, model is not that, so I'm not sure if we can see the differences, but, but yes, with larger model, yes. Okay, so now we are using CUDA, which is GPU. So, well, let's see. Yeah, it seems faster. So cut the time to half, I guess. So, and then also my model does learn something now, right? So each time the accuracy uh, improve, improves. Okay. And then let me change one more parameter there. So, uh, so yeah, I got the 16% accuracy now. So let's change one more parameter, which is the learning rate. So to increase it, a, by by ten, and then. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, really? Okay. Wow. So yeah, we I, I, we will finish very fast. So. Okay. So well. It's, and if you want, you can let your students in. So. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free. So. Oh uh, yeah. Right, right. Okay. So, yeah. So, well, let's see uh, why they're increasing the uh, parameter. Well, the learning rate will help. <clears throat> Kiss me. And doesn't seem, well, could be. Uh, I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah, learning more. But then also decrease. So, which means the learning rate is too large. And so remember the cause function shape, it will just shoot over. Yeah, go to. Oh, it's, uh, you just need to run some experiments to see, okay, so maybe this one will be better. And then, so normally we will run a few tests and then try to set up all the parameters, then run the real training file a day or two. Uh, yeah, overnight, <clears throat> just me. So let's take a look. And then also well, while it is training, so we could, if we want, we could include more layers. For instance, I am going to create uh, one more layer, but remember the shape must match. So the output will be matching the, uh, the input needs to be matched the output from the last layer. And now I have a network 
<coughs> excuse me, a network with four layers there. Okay, so, well, oops, this doesn't learn well. So, okay, so well, let's try this one. So since I just, I uh, increased a layer there. And All right, so hopefully, oh, what performance I had before, I cannot remember. So actually this was the first or the second lecture for all my graduate student course. So we are doing pretty good. Okay, so if I really tune the parameters while, so I can get up to 86% accuracy. So, and, hmm, okay, so, well, this model doesn't learn well. Okay, so yeah, basically, yeah, you could uh, just play with it and then a uh, few things you, you may want, you could change the optimizers. So if you go to PyTorch, Excuse me, there are several, <clears throat> excuse me, called popular optimizers. Yeah, either um, SGD, et cetera. So, and what else? Yeah, I guess that's all. So, any questions? Yes, sir. So. Uh, no, actually. <clears throat> and the, well, also I updated the model, so I'm not sure because I increased one more layer, so it could uh, affect the results. So, yeah, so I, I hate to say that, but at the beginning of neural network study, we just, we just need to try different things. And then after you're doing it for a while, and then there are some theory we could follow, but at the beginning, just play with it. And all right, so any other questions? No, okay, so I think that's all I have. And let me stop sharing. Okay, so got a chat. Okay, thank you. So I will uh, stop sharing. Okay.